What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and just today, a bunch of the points were leaked for 9th Edition 40k via the previews for their updated Mutatorum Field Manual. And normally, there's nothing I like better than, you know, whining and complaining and uh, just being miserable about the state of the Tyranid faction and the balance of the game. So today, I figured uh, we would just do that. For those who don't know that document, the Munitorum Field Manual gives all the points for every weapon and unit in the game so that they can semi-regularly make changes to adjust points and maintain a semblance of balance. Now, obviously, I'm a diehard Tyranid player, so we're going to be talking about the Tyranid points changes specifically today. So I have here a document I created from the points that were spoiled online. Fair warning, these points come from a post and not the book itself and were transcribed by me, so there may be some element of human error in there. First going through the unit points changes, and I will specify that this is a little bit confusing because Games Workshop, in the cases of units in the Codex that have specific war gear options allocated to them, so things like Tyranifexes and Hive Guard that have weapons that appear only on their data sheet and nowhere else in the, in the game, they've baked a lot of those weapons points into the cost of the unit itself. So, for example, you can see the Hive Guard. Uh, we started at 18 points in 8th edition. We moved to 40 in ninth, which immediately sounds really terrible, but when you consider the points for an impaler cannon actually went down quite a bit, so you're you're only looking at a delta of plus seven points when you're buying your hive guard, uh, and these guys are going to come in flat units of uh, for three hundred for a, a unit of six, pretty reasonable increase I think. I was certainly expecting hive guard to be the most increased unit in the faction, um, and I think they got off super light. Unlike a lot of the other stuff we're going to talk about in this video, they are probably still going to see play in every game, and I think even more so in 8th ed, or in 9th ed, excuse me, now that the table is smaller and the objectives force more combat in the center, the Hive Guard's relatively short range is entirely counteracted. Uh, they won't be able to really counter battery enemy artillery almost at all anymore. Uh, outflanking and deep striking seems very weak uh, in 9th edition based on my games thus far, but... They are just able to kill everything your opponent puts in the middle of the table. So, uh, Hive Guard looking pretty solid. Uh, let's talk about the other changes, though, because this is where things get a little disappointing. Now, we can see that all, almost everything has gone up at least five points. And it, it seems to me like GW just wanted to make everything a multiple of five uh, for some reason. Which is uh, a little frustrating because things like Tyranid Primes, <laughs> which are... Uh, uh, and if you're, if you're not bringing warriors, there's no reason to ever consider one. And if you are bringing warriors, they are an unfortunate tax, a requirement of the Tyranid warrior, uh, a stat line. And, uh, they went up five points just, I guess, because someone copy pasted a, a five point change in, into the document, uh, for no reason. I, this, <laughs> it's super silly. Uh, yeah. Models like death leaper and red terror going up five points, like just so that they could say they made a change. Uh, feels weird. Also, Neurothropes only going up five points. Probably the most single included uh, character in, in the faction. For sure the most uh, included character in the faction. Only going up five points. Uh, seems a little silly to me. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have Broodlords going up ten. Not super surprising because I think a lot of people believe that they're uh, an important unit. I don't like them, so I was uh, a little surprised to see that they went up uh, that many points, but... Uh, that's fine. Uh, Hive Tyrants went up 12. Wing Tyrant, Tyrant, Hive Tyrants went up 10. I was hoping that Hive Tyrants would stay at their same cost or even get a, mi a, a minor break. Um, because they are there. I mean, I, I think the Hive Tyrant body is extremely powerful, but I do think that they are a little bit overcosted, especially when you consider the weapon options the Tyranids can give them. The, uh, the Hive Tyrant itself, obviously two psychic powers. You, you have the, the psychic output of a librarian on top of a, um, just a super solid defensive profile with the four plus and vulnerable save. Uh, the downside is that they don't, they don't really, besides like a smite and a psychic scream, they don't really actually do any damage back to you. Uh, heavy venom cannons are not that exciting without spending a billion CP to buff them with relics and adaptive physiologies. And, uh, the other weapons are basically useless, I think, as the meta has been moving. If the meta moves more towards uh, horde centric, uh, style, 
then the, you, we may see um, sort of quad devourers or uh, quad death spitters come back in. But I think that the fact that like sort of salamanders are poised to become extremely powerful, um, Gravis units like eradicators are going to be taking over the meta, I think, pretty quickly. Having flat three damage and uh, trying to get past that o only minus one is going to be important. So looking at those heavy venom cannon builds is where we want to be with the winged hive tyrant or with the hive tyrant in general. And it is uh, unfortunate that it's just not sort of, I don't think it's worth that, like 155 plus uh, a 20 ish for a heavy venom cannon price. Uh, so probably 175, uh, almost 190 once you include melee weapons. Um, it seems extremely expensive for what you get, unfortunately. Like I said, the Neurothrope only went up five. Uh, Neurothropes are sick. Probably take a bunch of those. That's awesome. Um, the Turfagon going up 20 is, like, totally crazy to me. Um, that said, their Spine Burst, the ranged weapon, I, I don't think the post that I, I got these points from didn't have it included, so it may actually have been uh, made free, which means that they only went up 12 points, if that's the case. Uh, but still, kind of weird. <laughs> Turfaguns were... Uh, totally unplayable in uh, in eight that and we were mulling around a list in my head that used one to buff a gant swarm but uh, <laughs> given that they're gonna be becoming more expensive i don't think that's worth it um red uh, old one eye going up 20 points is like sort of flabbergasting as well because he's uh he's not good <laughs> it's He's, uh, he's a nine-wound character with no invulnerable saves. So he goes in, he gets to blow up one thing, and he dies. And spending 220 points to blow up your opponent's 150-point tank, probably not what you want to be with your life. Um, Swarmlord going up 20 points. I mean, that's fine. Swarmlord's still the most powerful model in the faction. So uh, I, I don't. you're going to make the cuts to fit him in regardless of his points cost, I think. And uh, so him going up 20 isn't that surprising to me. Uh, the troop choices, for the most part, aren't super surprising. The one that, that totally caught me off guard was Gene Steelers going up four. Uh, the Gene Steelers going up 33 percent of their uh, of their cost. Now I should note that uh, Gene Steelers previously in eighth edition, uh, actually I think they were ten. This might be wrong. Uh, I think they were ten, and then two rending claws were two. So they came they came out to twelve points apiece. So they're only going up twenty percent because rending claws for Gene Steelers have been changed to to being free. So. You're not spending 17 points on your Gene Stealers, thank God. But Gene Stealers already got hit probably the hardest, uh, maybe in the game, uh, by the melee range change. So that they have to be within half of an inch of somebody who's already within half an inch of the uh, target in order to attack. Uh, Gene Stealers could, could pretty reasonably get all of their models, uh, the entire unit, into attack You know, one or two things in 8th edition. And that change makes it so you can only ever fight two ranks back, essentially. Uh, and that makes it totally untenable, I think, to, to play Gene Steelers in any sort of role where they're not just sweeping infantry. You can bring them as infantry sweepers, and I think that's fine, except now that they are uh, three points per model more <laughs> expensive <laughs> and harder to do that with, uh, I think it's probably worth keeping them at home. So unfortunately, Gene Steelers already got hit hard by the mechanics of the game. Yeah, obviously, also having to bring them in units of 20 typically meant that they got ripped apart by blast weapons. Uh, you, uh, Your opponent being able to block or to, to um, cut through uh, try points now as well. Um, thanks to Desperate Breakout. Uh, also, another mechanical nerf to Gene Steelers. So Gene Steelers just got hit literally three ways, three different ways. Um, for a unit that was, to be honest, uh, slowly being phased out of tier hit lists already. Um, so uh, put your Gene Steelers on the shelf for 9th edition, everybody. I think that they are unplayable garbage now. Hormagons went up one point. Uh, Ripper Swarms went up, uh, surprisingly, only one point. Uh, that is, I think, probably because infantry are required to perform many of the actions that objectives need now in the game but that said um the ripper swarms were already one of the most ef uh, efficient troops choices available to anyone and uh, now they are just three points more expensive so ripper swarm still very solid termagants went up one point uh based on the cultist changes that we saw spoiled these aren't surprising to me but i was hoping to avoid them um but i think that's fine honestly uh, i've been building a lot of lists at 1750 and uh, just getting this little increase with a bunch of, even if you're maxing out your term against, you're probably only adding 100 points to that. So you still have, uh, if you're building into that 750 list, you should you should still have, uh, you know, more points for other stuff left over. Uh, Warriors went up three points. And in addition, their war gear also increased <laughs> in addition to the tyranny prime increasing. Uh, Warriors, I think, are on, were on the verge of playability come ninth edition because uh, really... 
Uh, ob objective secure bodies that are hard to kill. Um, not that warriors are super hard to kill, but you can uh, spend resources, you know, to make them more difficult to, to kill. They were already looking like they may be playable and maybe the basis of a list, but going up three points, uh, they went up four, I think, on their Despiter build uh, loadout. And then in addition, you, t you add another five on top of that for the prime going up. It's like, come on, really? Um, you compare these guys to like a unit of intercessors. They just get out of totally outclassed. It's really depressing. <laughs> so um, I will probably still try to put warriors on the table. I think that the plan may now be to like make them as cheap as possible, like put spine fists on them or something uh, and just use them to stand places and maybe maybe uh, as uh, caddies for venom cannons. But um, I uh, I was hoping to see a little bit of a break on warriors, but unfortunately they went up. Let's go down to the Elite Choices Sahara Specs went up 20 points. <laughs> I had to look up what a Hara Specs did because I <laughs> never seen one before. Uh, and it was it went up massively. Sure, thanks, G-Dub. That's what we needed. Lictors went up 12, probably in part because of the new interaction between strategy, the Stratagem and Strategic Reserve, where Lictors allow you to deep strike almost anything, basically, in the faction for 1 CP, which is pretty good. Uh, 1 CP in addition to your Strategic Reserve CP. So for a 2 or 3 CP, you could probably drop anything on the faction on the table. Um, so that's probably why Lictors saw a little bit of an increase. Uh, it makes Death Leaper look a little bit better now that the, the gap between them isn't quite as big, but um, Death Leaper losing his ability to be minus two to hit is still a little problematic. So maybe look at this 42 point Lictor. I think that's fine. Maliceptor going up 10. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pyro 4 went up three, which is, I think, fair because they were, they seemed under costed at 25 points for their body. But they were, there's just never a situation <laughs> in which you needed them. If we do move to more of a, um, um, uh, horde centric meta maybe we see pyrovores pump back in uh, they basically have a heavy flamer on them uh, for 25 points and uh, four wounds so which is uh, which is a really solid stat line but uh, nobody ever needed them right in <laughs> in uh, eighth edition you had quad devour tyrants you had jane stealers you had other stuff that could kill um that could kill uh infantry that also filled up your battalion slots. So maybe, I don't know, maybe we see pyrovores now and a three point increase isn't that big. Uh, high, high tyrant guard going up three points. Uh, sure. Uh, venom throws going up three points. This is again, like a lot of things just sort of changed with no reason. I think venom throws were probably invalidated by the stacking, the, the no stacking of hit modifiers. So now that there's dense cover on the table, basically venom throws are useless. Um, so they were already probably not going to be taken and, and GW is just copy pasting a three point change on everything just to say that they did, I guess. So, uh, that's, that's kind of frustrating. Zone throws went up five. Um, zone throws may be another direction forward that the faction could take given that again, they are a resilient unit. They can set on objectives and they're actually, unlike other things like warriors, they're actually deal damage back, uh, in their, their super smites, um, for, for a brief shining moment. Uh, they will be able to, at least in this preview season, it looks like they'll be able to double smite, uh, which is just an insane amount of damage. You're putting like sort of eight to 10 mortal wounds out of turn, which is not okay. Um, and that will probably be nerfed upon release. So uh, prop, don't build a list around that. But if you are bringing, you know, six to 12 zone throws, <laughs> enjoy it while you can, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I think. Um, but uh, it's, it'll be interesting to see if zone thropes um, make the cut in the future because it looks like the zone thrope package didn't go up that many points, especially with neurothropes not really being hit at all. And then we talked about Hiveguard before. Hiveguard looked like they got this huge 22-point change, but in, in reality, it only went up 7 because their Impaler Cannon got a huge discount. Down to Fast Attack, Gargoyles went up 2 points. This was not surprising to me at all. Uh, given the new, the way the new objectives were gargoyles actually, uh, the, and of course the new detachments, uh, gargoyles got a huge buff. You no longer needed to focus on troops choices. Um, and you wanted really like 30 man units of, uh, of bodies just to fill objectives with. They don't have obsec, which is a downside, but if you can just hive guard off all of the intercessors or whatever, that's on an objective and plot, like just blast 30 gargoyles onto it. Uh, a lot of times you could hold that objective down for a turn. And then in the comparison between them and Hormigons, they're just better in almost every way. They're faster. They don't do as much damage in melee, but they have a gun. Um, they have their interesting uh, minus one to hit uh, effect in melee as well, which is really powerful. And it, because you're not required now to fill up as many battalions as possible, there's no reason not to look at other 
uh, four sorg slots rather than just troops. So if you have your three troop choices and you don't want to just spam, you know, five point infantry looking into just replacing Hormagons with gargoyles was probably the way to go. Uh, and in a lot of my lists, I was doing that. I was bringing, you know, 90 Hormagans, 90 gargoyles. Uh, and now they're going up two points to seven, probably still playable in a lot of uh, horde style lists. But it definitely makes me consider the term against a little bit more because the two points of two extra points per uh, model is, it ends up being a lot. Um, I don't really care about spores or raveners. I, I don't think that they're going to be particularly playable raveners, especially like when I increase the points cost of raveners, guys. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, anyway, thanks, G Dub. Uh, going down to heavy support. This is where I was I was hoping for some for some spice. Uh, in the heavy support slot. Heavy support slot, uh, I think it's going to be where all the damage comes from in 9th edition for almost every faction. Now that uh, monsters and vehicles are so powerful with the ability to shoot in melee and move and shoot uh, heavy weapons without penalty, and the fact that you want to be as resilient as possible on the table so you can hold objectives for longer, uh, just getting these big stompy bodies is going to be powerful. And I was hoping to that end that we'd see Carnifexes uh, get some lovin' because Carnifexes in, uh, in, in 8th edition... Uh, I'm going to say it, they were real bad. And uh, you probably, if you took them in your list, you probably were making a mistake. And uh, I was hoping if they stayed the same points or they got a little reduction, uh, as soon as you started uh, to um, compare them to the, the armored units of any other faction in the game, you got really depressed because <laughs> they were so terrible. Um, and so I was like, hey, maybe we get a couple points off the Carnifex. Nope, GW says, fuck you. You get the 13-point increase. Not to mention that most of their war gear also went up, which we'll talk about in a sec, too. So you're probably shelling out 120 points for a reasonably kitted out Carnifex. Um, totally, totally unplayable. <laughs> Just throw these guys out. Oh, my God. Uh, Biovores went up 10. Um, the Biovores were okay, and I think on the smaller table... And with probably more move blocking terrain on the table, Biovores will probably go up in stock. Not to mention that indirect fire is just like super powerful right now. Uh, so uh, that doesn't surprise me that Biovores are getting an increase. Uh, and I think they're probably still going to be playable. And especially, yeah, just to just to drop dudes in front of your opponent, so they're they're not able to get to objectives and things. Uh, Biovores probably going to be insane. Uh, the Exocrine went up 15. <laughs> it is a sad state of affairs when the Exocrine, probably the one of the most powerful uh, single models in the entire faction in 8th edition, went up almost as many points as the Carnifex, one of the least playable models in the faction. Um, whoever thought that was a good fucking idea is an idiot. Probably should be fired. So anyway, Exocrines are still sick. They went up 15 points. You're going to spend 45 more for your like, three triple Exocrine battery. Uh, their 36-inch range covers almost the entire table now. They have a reasonable stat line to survive counter battery. Uh, they're just good. They're just super duper good. And uh, in almost every game I've taken three of them, they've sort of been the all-stars of the game. The downside of Exocrines right now is that they don't sit on objectives very well. Uh, so, And they can shoot into melee, but that doesn't... I mean, they, they don't want to, right? They, you know, they want to get minus one to hit. Um, not to mention that their melee stats are bad. Uh, but I think three may be too many uh, is what I'm, I'm finding out. You may want to drop down to two because having two means you, you can just put more obsec dudes on the table to run into objectives and screen for the exocrines. But the exocrines are in, in, insanely good at just blasting your opponent off of their objectives throughout the entirety of the game. So exocrines and hive guard, again, I mean, the, the face of Tyranids isn't changing that much. We're just losing our gene stealers, basically. The Moloch went up. Uh, sure. <laughs> Screamer Killer went up 15. Thornback went up 10. Uh, yeah, just rub just the rubbins from <laughs> from the game designers here. The Toxicrine went up 25. Uh, I was actually just about to build a list of three Toxicrines in it because they, I think at 125 with the um the game in a state that it is in ninth ed uh is probably pretty good. Uh, going up to 150. Hmm. Maybe not so much, but uh, 125, 375 for three of them. They could just blitz onto objectives. Their their melee output um, is shockingly good. And I wasn't ever anticipating an eighth edition to sort of ever deliver them, which is why I never really took them. Uh, because, you know, they're only a seven inch move, I believe. And uh, you have to like sort of double move them with Swarmy to get any reasonable threat range. Their, their defensive stats aren't great. They're just a T7, 12 wound. Uh, so they're, they're about average in terms of defense. 
and uh, effectively no ranged attack to speak of. They have a little little bitty one, uh, and they can flip their tentacles at you, I guess. But so I, I never expected them them to actually get there in eighth ed. But going into ninth ed now that the objectives are all centrally located and your opponent has to to camp them to do anything. Uh, being able to just drop these three idiots on the table that can basically almost for sure, like kill five dudes. Um, they'll, and especially if you, if you buff them with adaptive physiologies, like a murderous size and a toxic green is insane. Even a five plus invulnerable save on a toxic green, probably still worth it. And, um, they, re- they just have a natural reroll wound rolls, uh, clause in there at uh, the start at strength seven, I believe with a D three damage weapon with full rerolls and seven attacks on the charge. Uh, it, pretty, it's very solid, uh, melee stat line for a unit that now I think can actually make it to melee. Uh, so it's not surprising to me that they went up points. I was hoping that it wasn't going to be 25. Um, so maybe uh, less excited about trying to play toxic greens in a, in a monster mash style army, but I think it may still be playable. Um, you try gone to try gone prime each one up. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, sure. The Turan Effects is a little bit of an interesting one. Uh, Turan Effects is another one I was hoping to see a little bit of a break on. I think, honestly, it's it's just poorly de- it's a poorly designed model. <laughs> uh, in general, it's uh, it requires it needs to stand still, but it gets a benefit for moving, which it has now lost in Ninth Edition because now everyone gets it. And what its its most unique and interesting weapon is Range Eighteen that it needs to stand still to use effectively. <laughs> so it's like. Uh, not to mention that you're probably going to stand still and just kill your target with the, with the 2d6 shot or pull them out of range. And then they, um, they will not get another shot. That said, uh, again, the board is smaller. The objectives are more centrally located. So an 18 inch weapon like that may be playable talking specifically about the acid spray. And, uh, but they got a, um, a 39 point increase. So (laughs) there's that A, a bit of a shocking one to me. I feel like GW probably, expected monsters and vehicles uh, because of their new mechanical core mechanics changes to be much more powerful. And so they sort of had a boilerplate points increase for them. The difference is that none of almost none of those changes affect the Tyran effects. Uh, shooting in melee is a big deal for sure, but uh, it already ignored moving and shooting. <laughs> with heavy weapons so that's just pointless and it's the same with you know i should mention as well um other things like carnifexes and uh and the exocrines like <laughs> if they don't get any benefit or the carnifexes excuse me um specifically uh and hive tyrants i should say the exocrine uh, does benefit a little bit from being able to move and shoot its gun um but carnifexes and hive tyrants uh don't get any benefit from being able to move and shoot heavy weapons because they have no heavy weapons they can take uh, i mentioned this in the in the tiered wishlist video um, I hope we get an alternative mechanic to sort of ins- to, to shore that up or we just get a big, huge points decrease uh, for the fact that there's a core mechanic that we're paying for that we, we cannot use. Um, but uh, and, and, and not to mention also that they have heavy, a heavy Venom Cannon is blast, so you can't even shoot it in melee. So most of the time, the new Ninth Ed uh, rules, uh, uh, monster vehicle rules, will not be useful for this faction, uh, which is frustrating, especially since it was sort of one of the core parts of their... Uh, of their marketing is that hey, Tyranids with big bugs can shoot in melee and stuff. And you're like, well, can we though? Anyway, here's the Tyrannifex effects with acid spray. Uh, the acid spray, as we can see here, did get 15 point decrease. So this 39 point increase isn't quite as, uh, as big as we expected. I also, like I mentioned before, I can't find the points for the little spine burst thing. So, uh, I, that may be zero. I've included it in this calculation, uh, but we may be eight points off here. Um, but with the acid spray, we're looking at 203, with the rupture cannon build, we're looking at 218. Um, probably too expensive, to be honest. Uh, although I think I'm gonna play, I'm gonna try them in at least one build. Uh, it may just be the toughness eight in a billion wounds with that acid spray is still fine, and the ability to shoot in melee. Um, but uh, it, I don't know, doesn't feel great to me. Tyrannosite went up 15. Uh, I don't think, with the new strategic reserve rules and the new Lictor ability, I don't think we're ever going to be playing one again, unfortunately. I did like my Tyrannosite list uh, <laughs> with the hot air balloons coming in from, with High Fleet Yormagander for forward rerolls, but uh, I think it was uh, it was more janky than anything. And their war, their war gear is getting increased too. So, great. And then some other stuff that I think no one's going to take anyway. Harpies, Hive Crones, both fires that don't benefit from the aircraft rules. So, uh, again, a bunch of changes to them that they are not able to use. So, cool. Uh, going down to the war gear specifically, uh, I did. So I mentioned before that we can see all of these uh, positive points decreases are on war gear that is only available to specific data sheets, meaning that um, 
it's, it's only one, basically only one thing can use them. Uh, so they have, they've just baked those points for those, uh, those particular items into the points for uh, the, the body that carries them now, which is a little weird and it seems unnecessary, but I mean, that's how it is. Uh, so obviously acid spray went down. Almost everything went up by a couple points. Despiters went up by one. So you're spending an extra one if you're going to kit out those, the, your warriors or the despiters. Uh, so really they went up four points. Um, devourers stayed the same, thank goodness. Brain leech worm devourers went up. Uh, might be fine still if we're playing into a, um, a horde-centric meta. I think brain leech devourers are still probably worth taking or at least worth looking at for that reason the heavy venom cannon went up too which was disappointing to me because it did get blast and i think uh it sounds a little contradictory but i think blast is a downside on the heavy venom cannon it's only a d3 shot weapon so sometimes it gets to max uh for three shots which is nice except you're not going to be shooting it at a horde of infantry if you if you don't have to because it it's a flat three damage um for uh strength nine so you want to hit that hit vehicles and monsters with that uh, in which case the blast keyword doesn't do anything. And then once you get into melee, you can't shoot it because it's blast. So uh, I actually think it's it's been nerfed a little bit, or, or I guess comparatively to other to other guns. But for only two points increase, I think that's fine. Um, you probably won't even notice that. Other, other random stuff went up by one. Spine fists <laughs> went up by one. Standard venom cannons went up by three. Uh, a little A little frustrating. An additional cost for the warriors and the tyrannocyte as well there. Uh, and then getting into our melee weapons, uh, Crushing claws, claws got a little bit of a re reduction because that minus one to hit is so brutal on them. Um, I think a lot of times you probably still won't be taking them in, in favor of just the flat three damage weapons uh, that for, for, for flat strength, especially since we still have Voracious Appetite, which is a little bit more useful because you can spend more, C you have more CP to spend on it. Um, so those monsters are going to have full rerolls on their stuff anyway. Plus, I should mention too, Crushing Claw is sort of a poorly designed uh, mechanic they're basically a power fist, right? Or a thunder hammer. They, they, they're flat three damage and they double your strength uh, for, for a, a, in exchange for a minus one to hit. Um, except that almost every Tyranid monster is strength six. So you're not strength seven. Doubling that would get you to 14, which means that you wound other T7 on, on twos, uh, which is actually a legitimate um, trade off because you're suddenly. You know, you're getting minus one to hit for plus two to wound, basically, which is, uh, I think, which is usually mathematically where you want to be for that trade off. Um, so normally it gives you plus it's minus one to hit for plus one to wound, which is uh, just sort of a, a wash. So you might as well grab something that also gives you an additional benefit like a uh, sliding talon. I think that's a that's sort of a. Uh, just a design flaw in Tyranid monsters. Most of them are strength six and uh, really deserve not to be. Uh, they should be strength seven or eight for the most part. And I think that would see, make them see uh, they, they would be much more effective at that point. Strength six is a, a cutoff point on strength where it makes it almost entirely useless. You make, you don't, you, you don't wound anything besides basic infantry on twos. You don't get to the, uh, to wounding T4 on twos. You don't wound T7 vehicles on, uh, except on fives, <laughs> which is like, Okay. Uh, I think murderous size helps out a little bit, the, uh, the adaptation, but a lot of these melee weapons stayed the same as we can see, which is good. Uh, we saw, uh, scything talents and carnifexes went up by one, but if you buy two pairs, it's still basically free now. The second pair is free, which is nice if you're building melee carnifexes, um, which may be where you want to be. I don't know. Uh, and then Hive Tyrants made mostly the same. This is all kind of boring, to be honest. <laughs> we saw some minor changes and things like tusks. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. Uh, the, the, the final Tyranid point changes. Now I've been playing a bunch of games with Tyranids with the ninth edition rolls and we were playing pre points, uh, obviously. So we, we basically, everyone just docked themselves like 200, 250 points. Um, it seems to me that Tyranids may be a little bit on the, the winning end of that. Uh, if, in most of my lists, I think I add, I add like 50 points for my hive guard. I add maybe a hundred points for troops and I add like 50 points for my, for my exocrines. And then, uh, the, the, otherwise they've mostly stayed exactly the same. So uh, it may be that I uh, sort of docking myself a couple points, but I think for the most part, if you've been playing at 1750, your list is mostly going to stay the same. Uh, I was hoping that these points changes would bring with them some, some buffs to our worst units and uh, they did not uh, they in fact took units that were already unplayable I think in uh, in ninth edition and made them worse uh, Carnifexes maybe were it, at, at their old points limit of 67 points may have been playable if because uh, you're you're at the, the level where you can spam them like you can spam 90 to 100 point Carnifexes pretty realistically when your opponent's tanks are all going up in cost um, Carnifexes increasing to match <laughs> is 
shocking to me, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, I can't imagine seeing these guys on the table competitively anytime soon. Uh, just look at the, the at the more interesting monsters if you're in, instead of Carnifexes. Um, it's hard to justify a Carnifex over a Hive Tyrant sort of. For an extra probably 50% of your cost, a Hive Tyrant gets you two Psychic Powers and is about twice as hard to kill. It's plus 50% wounds in addition to a 4 plus Invulnerable save, which is already plus 50% um, or so uh, survivability. So it's... Uh, it's <laughs> Uh, the comparison is really depressing. Um, current effects has needed some love and they didn't get it. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the part I'm the most disappointed about. I think, um, I think Tyrann effects is, and things like, uh, toxic greens may have some play. I- I'm a disappointed that they went up in points, but it may still be worth trying them out because mechanically they're so different. Otherwise I think stick with triple exocrine, uh, drop your hive guard in and um, then some stuff that can potentially sit on objectives. Uh, I I think I have a sneaking suspicion warriors are probably unplayable still. I'm going to try a couple more games with them before I give them up entirely, but uh, having in, in addition to a, a points increase, um, also just not being very good. <laughs> it uh, uh, sucks for them. But I think the where uh, Tyranids may end up is um, relying on their guns to deal all of their main damage, so uh, sitting back on triple exocrine or in hive guard. Um, or some combination of that, and then just jumping in uh, either a custom high fleet with like a six plus invulnerable save, or high fleet Leviathan, um, or maybe if you're feeling lucky, just dropping uh, Kraken so you can put as many, uh, just as much movement on the table as possible, and um, just sitting on Termagants, five point Termagants to uh, make them harder, as hard as you can to kill, and hope that they survive on an objective for a round. It's unlikely, but uh, so. This video it probably, it probably is coming out before a video that Sung Soo and I recorded talking about our first impressions of uh, Ninth Edition. So I'll give you a little sneak peek of that. I like to think that in the past I've been optimistic about Tyranids um, in Eighth Edition, and I've had good success with them. I've won many, many tournaments, uh, and I've um, I've you know placed highly in a lot of them, and I've been able to tech them into beating uh, particularly meta matchups. But um, in ninth edition, without an entire rebalance of the faction, I think the Tyranids are absolutely unplayable. Um, I don't, I can't, I, I, I'm going to try, <laughs> but I can't comprehend a build with the current rules and points values that doesn't get absolutely plastered. And almost all of my games, once my opponents sort of worked out their ninth edition lists and how the game was going to progress, uh, my opponents are able to win like 90, 30, almost every time it's, uh, it's really bad. It's absolutely, certainly not the experience that I've had in eighth edition where I felt like Tyranids in ITC had play throughout the entire game and could compete effectively using their maneuverability to their advantage. Now, uh, because the melee game is, uh, at least for infantry is effectively pointless um, in addition to the fact that the mobility is less effective because the board is smaller, I think uh, Tyranids have no way to go. Um, the, and, and then, uh, of course, the overarching issue is that you, you have to survive on an objective for two rounds, and there's nothing in this book that is survivable. Um, you can get to the, T, T, the T8 14 wound vehicles like Tyran effects, but you're spending 200 points on them. Um, they have no invulnerable save without spending additional resources into them. And they don't do that much damage at the end of the day. <laughs> Not to mention that they don't have obsecs. So sometimes your opponent may just be able to throw a bunch of intercessors on the objective and you won't be able to kill them quickly enough. I hate to say it, but uh, without some without some huge rebalances, I think it's uh, probably a good time to shelf your Tyranids and hope for a new book or something like that. But uh, we'll see what the tournament packet comes out with. Uh, but I have I, I, I don't have much hope that it will it will make Tyranids much better than they uh, than they are right now. Before I close out the video, I want I want to address some of my feelings on the Tyranids, I'm, and especially the points changes. Uh, I think this video felt very negative in that I was criticizing almost every points change in that it was an increase in points. And now, obviously, nobody wants <laughs> their points of their models to increase, and it's not a fun experience for anyone. But the Games Workshop was upfront with the fact that points costs would be increasing across the board. The difference was that the points cost increases for Tyranids specifically felt unwarranted in most cases, and comparatively to other factions, Tyranid seems harder hit than a lot of factions, especially ones that weren't even doing that poorly in 8th edition. I have a chart here from a Facebook page called Mob Rules, 
And Mob Rules went through the entire field manual and calculated the average point change, including war gear, across all of the codexes in the game. Now, I don't personally know how accurate this information is and whether or not everything was taken into account. I can't validate its veracity, but it sounds pretty reasonable. Uh, and it lists the factions that have been hit the hardest by the cho point changes. And to be honest, it's pretty telling that out of the top seven, five of them are Xenos. Not to mention that only really Craft World Eldar, Tau, and Adeptus Mechanicus out of that list could have been considered highly competitive armies. Orcs and Tyranids both competed at different levels pretty reasonably, but neither of them uh, were ever considered nearly as powerful as factions like Chaos Space Marines, Adeptus Astartes, even Astra Militarum. So part of the reason that I'm, I'm so negative in this video is that, you know, Tyrannid's getting this average of nine a 19 point increase across their faction while also being hit multiple ways by the core mechanics of the game and the revisions to primary objective scoring uh, makes it very difficult to view these changes positively at all. And in a lot of ways feels like sort of a death blow to the faction. If you want to read more about this particular chart, you can head on over to facebook.com slash mobruleak and check those guys out. They did do a write-up on the biggest winners and losers out of the Munitorum Field Manual. I don't agree with all of it, but I do think that there is some additional interesting information there. So if you're looking for more 9th edition info, I recommend you check it out. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this coverage and found it informative of the Tyranid faction and uh, weren't too put off by my unending tide of pessimism. I hope everybody's having a good time so far playtesting 9th edition and grinding those games. And I hope if you enjoyed this content, you consider subscribing to the channel and checking me out on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. We can get all sorts of cool benefits. That's going to be it for me today, everybody. Thanks for watching again. Keep it classy, folks. And remember to have happy wargaming.